All right, let's turn the 30-second board sideways and talk hot topics as we preview Pro Motocross. We're going to start with the 250 class, which is pretty wide open. You never know what young rider or even veteran is going to suddenly figure it out, but we're going to do our best to focus a bit. We think the three top contenders coming in are going to be Hunter Lawrence, Joe Shimoda, and Justin Cooper. What do you think of that list, Daniel? Well, I tried to compile a list yesterday, and it was a lot of fun because there's probably 15 names on there that would... I, I think would be able to make an argument with what we're about to say here, which is that, yeah, Shimoda, Lawrence, and Justin Cooper, to me, are the clearest favorites on paper. For me, it starts with Joe Shimoda, the way he finished last season, second overall in the championship. That final ride at Fox Raceway was one of the best I've ever seen out of him. And Hunter Lawrence, I mean, he's only won one pro motocross, which is weird, but the way he's ridden in 2023, he's been phenomenal from the first gate drop till now. Um, obviously, he's one of the favorites, but Justin Cooper seems to be the name that everyone's forgetting. And JT, I just got to ask you, this is a guy who didn't have a full schedule this year on the 450s. Was that a good strategy? Was that by design? I mean, kind of take me through, you think, the process with Justin Cooper and if it was a good or good idea or not to skip so many races and prepare for this national championship. The big picture, I do think it was the right decision for him if the goal and solely the goal is to be your pro motocross champion this summer, right? Because you have to remember, he was doing pretty well in Supercross. I think he surprised all of us with top 10 finishes right away. And for him to step away from that, step away from a, a factory 450 effort to prepare for this series, I think shows the level of dedication and motivation for him to go out and win races this summer. If you think back to the end of 2021, he was so close to becoming champion in this class. If I'm Hunter Lawrence, I'm absolutely concerned with Justin Cooper because you know how great of a starter he is and you know how prepared he should be. He's been doing moto after moto for the last two months while everyone else in the field has been worried about Supercross. Ooh, interesting. And then uh, there's someone else that probably has a similar bent, a motocross focus, and that's Jeremy Martin, who's now on the Muckoff FXR Club MX Yamaha team. He's a two-time champ in this series. He did race most of the Supercross rounds this year. But by his own admission, this is really his focus, 250 motocross. So, Daniel, I think we're going to see a better J-Mart outdoors than in. But can it be a winning J-Mart? Can Club MX get overall wins or even a title? You know what's weird is as time goes, you kind of you, you run out of belief in, in guys like that, right? He's a two-time champion, but you're kind of thinking, oh, he's been injured, he's gotten older. I, do I still believe? But then I go back to the fact that his body has never really been there in the summer, at least the last few years, because he's had Supercross injuries that keep taking him out. Well, he got through it this year, and that was the goal. Get through Supercross and just be okay so you can come in with a full head of steam. And just like Justin Cooper, he's been training on motocross for a long time. He's been doing a lot of motos. He is a two-time champion in this class. So, yeah, he should be on our, on our radar. I mean, I think it would be disrespectful to not have him on there. But JT, at the same time, this is not a guy who's had a lot of recent success, unlike the two-time MXGP world champion, Tom Vial, who should also probably play a role in this championship. It's funny you mentioned that a rider just trying to get through Supercross to be healthy for pro motocross, because that's how I really viewed Tom Vial's Supercross season. He had never ridden Supercross whoops until this past October. So to think he was going to come in and be a championship contender, I think, was Probably putting it a little bit ahead of the game, maybe 24, maybe 25. I think you see that out of them. But everyone that brought him over knew that he could be a contender in motocross. And he's coming in healthy. He's coming in prepared. And I think he's going to surprise some people because if they're judging him off Supercross, that is not a fair comparison. That's not what he was, in my opinion, really brought over to shine for. He was brought over to be a championship contender this summer. And he knows how to do it. He's been winning races overseas for the last three or four years in preparation for this. This is a series that Hunter Lawrence was really never that successful in. And we have a two-time champion in that series coming into this series. So I think it sets up nicely for him. I think being able to start on the great starts, which is a change for 2023, it's a consistent thing for him. He's gonna have a really nice setup. And I think you're gonna see him at the front almost every time. Now, does that mean he's gonna be leading every lap? Probably not, but I think he will start in the top five 90% of the time, and it's going to set him up for success. Even though he doesn't know the tracks as well as a lot of the other guys, he's going to be able to find the pace because he's going to start with them. All right, finding other contenders in this group. As Daniel said, you could probably go 15 deep. You never know who's going to catch fire. We'll just name three of them on this show, and we'll each pick one of the three. So we're talking RJ Hampshire, Levi Kitchen, who did win a moto last year, and Hayden Deegan, who was so sensational as a rookie in Supercross, and usually rookies are better 
in motocross. So, Daniel, I'll go to you. Which of those three, Kitchen, Hampshire, and Deegan, do you want to hit on here? I'll take RJ Hampshire, and it's because he's admitted he's a better motocross racer than a supercross racer. And if you look at what he did this season, all those second places and the victory there late in the championship, uh, he's just really kind of created this new RJ 2.0 where he's just been more solid, he's more efficient, he's a great starter, and he's better at motocross. So maybe this is a, the year that he takes the big leap again. There's a lot of riders in this field that have talent, but none of these guys have won this championship. Why not RJ Hampshire, JT? Yeah, I think he's going to be phenomenal. Um, I'm going to go with Hayden Deegan, and I'll tell you why. I've been wrong every step of the way on this kid. When we came into Houston at the East Coast opener, I really didn't know what to expect. I thought he would take his lumps, have some crashes from trying too hard. We didn't see any of that. He exploded out of the box and really improved every step of the way. And if you look at the final round, his heat race win, like he looked like the guy. Like he looked like he could challenge Hunter Lawrence for that championship hat, you know, and, and I think we'll expect that in 2024. So I have completely had to change my outlook on him. I, I admit that I was wrong. I underestimated him every round so i'm just going to jump to the front of that i'm going to completely flip and say that we're going to see a a very competent hayden deegan that yeah maybe he's not your champion but i think he's going to run at the front i think he's confident i don't think he fears anyone in this class and if you give him a good start look out yeah and usually good starts come with being on those very very fast monster energy yamaha star racing yz250fs although oddly that was the problem for levi kitchen last year he had speed but his starts rarely were good. And then one time he got a whole shot and he was so fast in Colorado last year that even Jet Lawrence is like, I tried to catch him, I couldn't. So we did see progress with Kitchen toward the end of Supercross. Even though he won a Triple Crown earlier in the year, he actually got faster and better, I feel, in the main events later in the season. So he can carry that momentum forward, finally fix the starts, which shouldn't be a problem on that motorcycle. Uh, he could be a contender too. And then, I don't know, you're just throwing a blanket over a ton of guys. There are some injured riders. I don't think we're getting Cameron McAdoo back instantly. I don't think Austin Forkner either. I think Seth Hatmaker is coming back. Max Boland's probably a little under the radar, but he's healthy and ready. The list goes on and on in the 250s. That should be phenomenal watch. Probably someone we didn't mention here is going to end up winning a race, but that's kind of the nature of that class and what makes it so fun. Now, we go to the 450s, and that's much more known commodities. Dylan Ferrandez is a former champ in this series. That's going to be a topic. We'll get there. But with Eli Tomac out... I think everyone wants to focus on the Chase Sexton, Jet Lawrence duel under the same truck. But first, Daniel, let's just acknowledge the greatness of Tomac and what a bummer it is to not have the number one out there this summer. You know, I was in Arlington, sat down with Eli, had the one-on-one -on -one conversation when he broke news that he was racing pro motocross and the SMX playoffs. And I was, I mean, when you have a guy like that, that's that respected and that good, you just want him there forever. You want someone to go and take it from him. That, that's what you want. And I'm bummed. I'm bummed that he's not there this championship because he won it last year. And it was a hard fought battle with Chase Sexton. But when it mattered most, he was at his very, very best at the end and won the championship. So, yeah, I would have liked to see him in there. Again, I, I'm more concerned with him uh, and his health than selfishly wanting him on the gate. Uh, Jason, I, I just hope that he's back at some point. You never know what those types of injuries, especially in this sport, because you don't really know a lot about him. But I guess my hope is that he's back for the playoffs and hey, maybe sneaks in a couple rounds of pro motocross to warm up. That's just dreaming on my part, but uh, that's all I got to go with right now, JT. Yeah, it's a bummer, right? You, you hate to start a series without the reigning champion, especially due to injury, uh, but there is time. You know, we're hearing some things that maybe it's not quite as bad as we feared and maybe he could get back to racing a little sooner than, than we were worried about. So. I just love to leave the door open. You know, these SMX playoffs give us this new opportunity that we've never had to see a guy return and still maybe lay claim to something great. Yeah, but what it opens the door is, this is what everyone wants to talk about, JT. You've got the two-time 250 champ, Jet Lawrence, moving up. Chase Sexton, who was so close to that title last year. And really, when you look at the ages, they're so much younger than the other contenders in the 450 class. This could be the rivalry of the future. And at least this summer, they're doing it for the same team. So I think, JT, this is where the true focus is going to be, at least from a drama standpoint. Ferrandis and others will want to weigh in on the title, but this is going to be fun to watch, Jet versus Chase. Well, we've been seeing this develop, right? It, we didn't necessarily get to watch it play out in Monster Energy Supercross, but if you go back to the Motocross of Nations last fall, there was talk of this, this is the first time that Chase and Jet will face off, right? Because we knew that Jet was making this move this summer and was like, okay, 
Where do they stand? They know that probably for the next decade, let's hope anyway, for the next decade, there will be championships decided between these two. We are lucky we just get to watch it. We don't have to be involved. We don't have to deal with any of the drama. We just get to sit back and enjoy it like all the all the great fans will. This is setting up for an all-time title fight. And this is Jet's first run at it. Yeah, Daniel, this is an embarrassment of riches for Honda. Uh, a nice problem to have, but it could end up being a problem in some ways. We'll have to see, huh? Yeah, that's, I'll be watching that too. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an admitted drama queen, so that's all I care about is what's going on in the truck. Uh, if it was me, if, if you could have a camera anywhere on the track, I would just move it inside the truck and just see how it goes. That's that's my summer. That's what I want to see. Um, but I have to imagine that the other ra- uh, riders in the series are probably a little annoyed and frustrated that we're even talking this way, JT. Uh, Dylan Ferrandez, he's a champion in this class. Adam Cincerello, Aaron Plessinger, they're 250 champions. Those are champs. Champs don't like hearing about other guys who have not won a pro motocross championship. Chase Sexton's never won one. And Jet Lawrence has never even raced a 450 pro motocross. So if you're Cincerello and Plessinger and Dylan Ferrandez, Weege, you're probably a little annoyed by this. But at the same time, I think this is the reality. They're probably going to be chasing around the two Honda system. So if you're Ferrandez, you're going to say, had I been healthy last year, I would have beat Sexton and Tomac again. I'm the favorite. I'm the best guy. And I believe he believes that, and that goes a long way. As for Cian Cerullo, I know that some people are probably snickering, saying, come on, you're really counting on AC in a grueling 22 Moto Championship. But it wasn't that long ago. JT, he took Zach Osborne to the wire in 2020 as a 450 rookie. Cian Cerullo is probably more capable outdoors. It just feels like it's been so long. A little bit removed as we are from Ferrandis' title, but this was a 2019 250 Pro Motocross champion. Followed that up with a runner-up position and, as you said, took Zach to distance in 2020. So he is capable. Uh, the one question I have with Zach, is, or excuse me, with AC, is this arm issue, right? He, he lose, seems to lose feeling, has a little bit of trouble holding on late in the races. We're hearing that maybe that's not as much of a problem in pro motocross as it was in supercross. So if that is a development and he is better, absolutely. Yeah, and as for Plessinger, it was kind of a average season last summer but i had actually forgotten he reminded me he broke his arm in supercross last year and he said when he went to the gate at round one palo last year he really was not ready and we heard a ton of teething issues with the first year of that new ktm last year so even with the slight injury that plessinger had toward the end of supercross this year he told me at salt lake city he's much further ahead on fitness preparation and just being ready for motocross this season than last season And the bike has taken many steps forward. So I think you're going to see a much better Plessinger than last year. The question is, how much better? But an even bigger question, we have so many guys on the sidelines that we don't know when they're going to be back. We think they will be because of the playoffs now. So that's playing out as we hoped. But Daniel, I mean, look at the list. Uh, Anderson, now we're hearing rumors that Cooper Webb might even fight his way back for round one. Justin Barsha's camp says he wants to be back for round one. Uh, Christian Craig, Malcolm Stewart, the list goes on. Uh, Barsha says he wants to be back at round one. The team is being optimistic that maybe he could pull it off, which I have heard it's long shot. Uh, Anderson, I haven't heard anything. And now Cooper Webb, you're hearing different things every day. And the last I heard is he wants to race the Nationals. And that's coming in a couple days. So I don't know if he's going to be there. I have no idea. But uh, those are some really high profile guys that won't start with us. But you have to imagine they're going to get their way in there at some point and probably play more of a role once we get later in the outdoors and into the SMX playoffs. And the races will be covered by myself and uh, Jason Thomas. We'll be there. You can watch everything on Peacock. Uh, Just a reminder, we'll have Race Day Live, which is our qualifying coverage starting at 10 o'clock local time every Saturday. And then the motos start at 1. And new for 2023, there'll be a half-hour break between the first set of motos and the second set of motos. That'll be our halftime show. So shout out to Peacock for giving us extra airtime so we can have extra content from the races. And JT and I will be there. I'll have James Stewart beside me in the booth at round one. Ricky Carmichael will be jumping in and out as well. Hi, folks. Lee Diffie from NBC Sports here. If you truly enjoyed what you just watched, you can get more news, interviews, and highlights by subscribing to the Motorsports on NBC YouTube page. You can get it all. So go for it.